that would, is like literally unrecognizable to an ancient African. You know what I'm saying? It's uh, Urban Apologetics. You know what I'm saying? I'm showing Black Denny with gospel. What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, the real Adam Coleman. Y'all know what it is, man. It's True Idea Apologetics. Uh, we here one more again, man. We here one more again, man. Um, and we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> we got a whole lot to talk about. Uh, but let me say this, man. It feels good, man. I feel like this is my first uh, full video recording journey that I've done just by myself in a while, man. You know what I mean? I'm definitely going to drop this as a podcast as well. So it feels good to be back in the game. You know what I mean? I'm glad you guys are back with me as well. And uh, yeah, man, like I said, we got a whole lot to talk about. We got a whole lot to talk about. Um, if you've been keeping up with the channel, then you know, man, that there's a whole lot going on in the Urban Apologetics community responding to a gentleman by the name of Brady Goodwin, a.k.a. The Fanatic, you know. Um, so uh, for anybody who doesn't know who that is, then clearly you must not be a Christian hip hop fan and, and maybe not a fan of the channel because I talk about Christian hip hop all the time. But uh, for, <laughs> for those who don't know, uh, Brady Fanatic Goodwin as a member or a former member, I don't know how that works, but a member of the, the cross movement, you know, that iconic Christian hip hop group, uh, the cross movement. And unfortunately, you know, some months ago, uh, he denounced the faith. He denounced Christianity, uh, adamantly. And, um, he just released a book, uh, last month, uh, August 15th, he released a book basically detailing reasons as to why he left the faith, you know, or at least some of them. So, um, yeah, man, um, as far as urban apologetics goes, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that this, I mean, this is what we do. You know, this is what we do. We respond to stuff just like that. And, uh, so we want to, um, take our time with it, man. Take our time with it. I got the book. Uh, the book is entitled, uh, let there be gaslight. Uh, I got my copy of it or at least, you know, through Kindle, I guess that counts as a copy. Uh, I definitely read it from cover to cover and I got some insights, man. I got some, some things that I want to, um, you know, kind of push back on, uh, definitely won't fit all within a uh, hour long show or whatever. I mean, but you know, for those who used to follow me back in the day when I was just doing a podcast, y'all know how I can get down, man. I mean, you know, it wasn't nothing back in the day to do like a, a three hour joint. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so I'm tempted to do that this time around cause I got a lot of notes, but, uh, you're probably going to break this up in a couple segments because uh, actually what I'm doing is it's actually myself, uh, BK Apologist, Eli Ayala, Vocab Malone, uh, Dr. Michael Brown and some others, uh, Damon Richardson, some other folks coming down the pike. We're all part of like this collective, uh, I guess, multi YouTube channel, multi video uh, response to the book. Let there be gaslight, you know, so I'm just just doing my part here. You know, I'll be taking a couple chapters of it and, uh, you know, really digging deep, man. So. Uh, yeah, but you know, that being said, um, you know, this is a big deal, you know what I'm saying? As far as urban apologetics goes, you know, uh, this is definitely the kind of thing we want to respond to. I mean, uh, Brady, uh, Goodwin is not just your kind of, um, you know, random dude off the street, you know, somebody who jumped into Christianity one day and then jumped out of it the next, uh, according to him, you know, he was a uh, Christian for about 30 years. He was in the game for about 30 years with 20 plus of those years, like 25 or so years of frontline in the ministry, man, whether it be rhyming, um, let me get some details right. My understanding is that he uh, graduated from Bible college at Lancaster and also graduated from Westminster. You know, so those are two, you know, uh, seminaries, I mean, you know, Bible colleges or whatever. Uh, Westminster is about as big as the name you're going to get you know, as far as uh, Bible colleges are concerned. Uh, he graduated from there. Apparently he taught apologetics. Uh, at the collegiate level at, uh, I believe is at Karam University. I might be, um, or Karam, or I might be mispronouncing that. Uh, but he apparently taught apologetics, you know what I mean, at the collegiate level. So, you know, this is not somebody that's uh, a novice, you know what I mean? So I guess um, out just out the gate, off rip, I want to kind of issue a, a, <laughs> a disclaimer to uh this series uh because i feel like uh, some of the things that, that need to be said may come off as kind of harsh uh but the reality is man um if you've been in the game for 30 years as a believer um if you've engaged in higher level education graduated from places like westminster and you've taught apologetics then from my end i'm expecting that when i review your work take a look at your work then i'm expecting some you know some rigorous stuff here you know, i'm expecting that there's going to be some high level argumentation to support your case and uh quite frankly um i think that the book uh you know i think that the book let there be gaslight left much to be desired man you know i think that um 
I guess he was gassed up, <laughs> but but you know it didn't quite amount to a a, a rigorous uh, case on his part. You know that he made throughout the book. I'm just be honest with you. You know, um, again, some of the things I have to say might seem kind of harsh, but um, I think that he made some some pretty uh, elementary basic errors. You know, at various parts in the book, particularly the philosophical pieces of it that we're going to highlight here over the next couple of videos. And so um, just stuff that I think is really just uncharacteristic for somebody who is supposed to be as learned as he is with respect to Christianity and apologetics. I mean, he just gets some really basic things wrong. So um, anyway, we're going we're gonna to dig into it, man. We're going to dig into it. So um, I think what we're going to do, we're going to start with chapter 12. This is going to be kind of like an overflow of the conversation that I had with Eli Ayala and Alice McElroy. Who's all, Alex McElroy is another person who's in, who's involved in our multi, you know, YouTube channel response. Uh, we had a conversation the other day on revealed apologetics. Y'all can definitely check that out for sure. And um, yeah, man, we had a lot to say, and I, I just had some extra. So I'm trying to. This is just like the overflow bars right here. You know what I mean? I had extra bars. Yeah, that that was all first verse. It was all first verse. We we come in with a second verse right here, and then we'll kind of move forward. So. Um, let me kind of give a bit of a background as far as chapter 12 is concerned. And then, you know, we're going to dig in, man. Like this is going to be, you know, somewhat of a, I won't say a super deep dive, but somewhat of a deep dive, you know, compared to much of what we do on the channel, uh, particularly in regard to, you know, talking about epistemology, you know, we're definitely going to be digging into some, some concepts, uh, you know, stretch your brain a little bit. Uh, but this is just one of them ones, man. You know, we got to be detailed. We really got to uh, dig in. So, you know, so forgive me if I'm, you know, staying tight to my notes. You know what I'm saying there's a lot of things I want to get to and I want to make sure that I'm framing things correctly. I'm be quoting him a lot. So, you know, lest I be accused of taking him out of uh, context or anything like that or misquoting him, I'm going to make sure I, I quote uh, his work as, as much as uh, need be anyway. Um, but yeah, man. So when it comes to chapter 12, right, um, I think this is kind of like the punchline or at least the first punchline of the whole book, right? He spends the first 11 chapters kind of laying out uh, the, the majority of his case. And then, you know, it, you know, this case against the Bible, against Christianity, so on and so forth. And then it's in chapter 12 where he you know, kind of wants to you know, lower the boom, so to speak. Or I guess at least come to the, the tail end or the, the uh, put a bow on it, on his on his argument, if you will. You know, I'll just put it that way. So um, I actually have a just kind of a summary of the first 11 chapters, at least as I understand it, in terms of the argument that he's making. Uh, if he watches this, you know, Brady, feel free to correct me. But this is your argument as far as I understand it. And then let me just kind of read this, uh, you know, just kind of make sense of, you know, what's going on in chapter 12 and responses that we want to give. All right. So. <clears throat> uh, so the summary, as I understand it, the argument that, he, that Brady is trying to make is that the proper way to understand the creation account in Genesis, particularly origins of humanity, is to interpret it literally. A literal, a literal interpretation of Genesis is not open to uh, some process of evolution playing a role in human origins. Uh, also, scientific evidence substantiates the theory of evolution, including how humans came to exist as they presently do. Uh, the veracity of the theory of evolution, therefore, renders the biblical account of creation, particularly of human origins, untenable, is indefensible. Uh, New Testament figures like Jesus and Paul take the Genesis account to be literal and make claims assuming this to be so. Given that this literal understanding of Genesis is mistaken per evolution, uh, the theological and anthropological claims made by Jesus and Paul are also incorrect. In light of the incompatibility between evolution and Genesis, the whole witness of scripture about human origins, sin, God, etc., including the testimony of Jesus and Paul, um, can rationally be taken to be false. Right. So as I understand it, uh, chapters one through 11, like what I just read, kind of sums up you know, the gist of his argument. You know, you got the Genesis account we should take literally. It doesn't add up when lined up with the evidence of evolution. Therefore, we should discard Genesis. Jesus and Paul and people like that make statements uh, based upon Genesis being literally true. In so much as that case, you know, we got to throw them out too. They got to go, you know. And so, you know, he kind of lays out this argument, you know, over the course of 11 chapters. And then here in chapter 12, he says this, uh, quote, this is on pa uh, page, this is on page 276. He says, quote, 
After considering the preceding chapters, we must ask, what implications does all this have for the core beliefs of the Christian faith and any religious worldview based upon the Judeo-Christian tradition? There are at least four pathways forward. Okay. Now it's probably going to be in the next video that I get into his, his four, you know, pathways forward. Um, but you know, for the time being, we're going to be. I think I'm going to subtitle this video "Higher Definition" or "Higher Definitions." Maybe uh, it's kind of a, <laughs> a little bit of a, a play on words, kind of tongue in cheek. There, uh, one of the the albums that uh, Crossman came out with back in the day was called Higher Definition, you know. So in this chapter, before he gets to the four pathways and essentially kind of how he ended up where he is, he lays out some definitions. You know, he wants to define his terms, which is cool. I mean, that's what he should do. You know, um, definitions are important. So he's going to lay out some definitions and then he's going to get into, you know, the specific uh, reasons or I, I would just say kind of the pathway he took to I don't know if he would consider himself to be an atheist or agnostic, but you know, wherever he is now, basically. And this is kind of where it gets a little dicey. This is where, you know, the red flags start going off for me. You know what I mean? Because as I was kind of reading through the chapter, as soon as I encountered some these definitions, man, I mean, it really started kind of uh, going off the rails a bit, you know, uh, which we'll, we'll kind of, you know, break that down here a little bit. Uh, but, but let me just be careful to say this, like, you know, we're, we're going to get into his definitions. We're going to be kind of, you know, slicing them apart and everything, but this is not like just, just petty nitpicking or something like that. Say <laughs> Okay. Um, when it comes to philosophy or when it comes to just good case making, good argumentation, definitions matter. Okay. Definitions really matter. Right. Um, to kind of use an analogy definitions to an argument, it's kind of like, if we think of an argument as being like a house, the definitions and key concepts that you're going to employ, you know, to build your argument, it's kind of like the, the foundational level of a house. If there's cracks in the foundation, then you're going to have a shaky house. You're saying you're going to have a house that isn't built well, right? Likewise, when it comes to definitions and key concepts that you're going to employ in an argument, if the definitions aren't solid, the argument's not going to be solid. That's just kind of, that's just the nature of how argumentation works. You know what I'm saying uh, another analogy might be something like um, imagine a football team, right? You know, it's football season. For those who who you know, follow me, you know I'm a Washington Washington Commanders fan. Unfortunately, um, so we're just going to use them as an example anyway, right? Um, let's say that the Washington Commanders take the field, and you know the offense is on the field. They're trying to score a touchdown. This is something that we don't do very often, or at least not often enough to win games. But we just, let's just, you know, kind of indulge me for a second, right? So uh, let's say that, um, you know, we take the field and, you know, we're trying to score a touchdown. Now, here's, here's the thing. You know, we all know that, or it's often said anyway, that football is the, the ultimate team sport, right? Now, I don't care how good of a quarterback you are. You can't throw the ball from your back, you know, while you're laying on your back, basically, you know. Uh, if you don't have good blocking, if you don't have a coach that can, you know, get players in the right place, then you're not going to be successful, you know. So every player, you know, on the team, every player that's on that offense has a role to play. And if it all doesn't work together, then it's not going to go well. You're probably not going to score that touchdown, right? So, for example, if if you're um, if you're an offensive lineman and you're blocking to the left, you're supposed to be blocking to the right. Or if you're the, the center and you're supposed to be hiking the ball on the third hut hut, but you hike it on the second one or the fourth. Uh, if you're if you're a running back, and you're supposed to hang back and, and, and block for the quarterback, but you want to go catch a ball. So you dip out to go catch when you're supposed to be hanging back to block. I mean, all these things, if, you, if you're missing your assignment, if you're not playing your role, then it's not going to go well for the play. It's not you're probably not going to get that touchdown. Right. So likewise. When it comes to argumentation, it's kind of like um, a touchdown would be like making a successful argument. And the definition is like each one of those players. If your definitions aren't right, then you're going to find yourself, you know, where players on the field are clashing. <laughs> your definitions are clashing with one another, not fulfilling their role. And ultimately, your argument is not going to be successful. You're not going to make that touchdown. Right. So that's why we have to spend time going over definitions and actually even just you know doing apologetics. Um, sometimes it's, it's healthy, it's helpful rather to slow a conversation down and interrogate one another's definitions. Like how are people using certain words and things like that? Because you might find, you know, either common ground or you might find some missteps at the definitional level. And so, um, that's kind of where we are now, again, this is, you know, 
where I encounter some missteps in Brady's book. You know what I mean? Is is uh, you know at least in chapter twelve, we'll deal with that for uh, for now. But some of these definitions is sketchy. <laughs> it's, it's real sketchy. You know what I mean? And um, as I, I I read a lot of philosophy. You know, what I mean? it's something that I really enjoy. And um, you know, when a philosopher is you know laying out definitions that are incoherent or clash with one another or anything like that, that's a red flag for me where I start to lose confidence in that person in terms of their ability to make a case or to make a strong argument. You know, um, I'm looking at it as if you can't really make a coherent argument if you can't provide coherent definitions. You know what I'm saying? It just at that basic level, if you're messing up already, then it's just not going to work, you know? And that's what I encounter here um, in chapter 12. So let's just kind of get into it a little bit uh, in terms of what I mean. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with uh, this concept of truth, right? Uh, truth is pretty important. <laughs> All right, truth is pretty important. I got my notes here. Let me let me adjust a little bit. Um, so, again, you know Brady before he gets into uh, the four pathways, ways that he believes that we can go, given the arguments that he laid out um, uh, earlier in the book, chapters one through eleven, he's laying out these definitions, right? And uh, the interesting thing is, you know, uh, he's got this you know cool exercise where before he kind of gives you his definitions, he you know gives you a page with like these blanks you're supposed to fill out your definitions of truth uh knowledge belief perception and opinion right he wants you to kind of throw your definitions out there and then he brings his in like a, a page later and so before uh you're given the opportunity to fill out your definitions with respect to truth he kind of throws a little jab at christians right quick right um he let me just go ahead and read it. this is on page 268 uh in regard to truth he says if you're a christian Try to resist the urge to respond with truth is a person and his name is Jesus Christ. Why should you resist this for now? Well, first of all, or first, the truth of two plus two equals four is quite indisputable. And the truth uh, and the truth is that you are reading this sentence right now. Yet neither of those truths are Jesus Christ. He puts in quotes. So our definition needs to be a bit more specific. OK, so. Um, he throws a jab at Christians and is like, okay, you know, in regard to this concept of the truth that we're about to define, you know, let's not go there when it comes to, you know, the whole Jesus is truth route. All right. Let's stick to what we could call propositional truths, right? When you look at the examples uh, that he gives, he says, first, two, two plus two equals four. It says quite indisputable. And the truth that you are reading this sentence, you know, right now, right? Uh, those are examples that point to or um, essentially are just like propositional truths, okay? Now, what I mean by that is, well, actually, let me start with uh, defining proposition, I guess, right? Uh, by proposition, I mean the content or the meaning of a statement or the meaning or content of a sentence, right? So if I say that it's raining outside, okay, it's raining outside, I could say that in English and you know what I mean. But let's say that I said it's raining outside in another language, like French, Spanish, Chinese, you know, whatever, whatever other language, right? If I say it's raining outside in some other language, then the sentence will look different. The words will be different, but the content conveyed will be the same. Right. So the statements themselves are different in terms of the wording and so on and so forth, because I'm using different languages. Right. Uh, but again, you know, the content or the meaning of those statements is the same. And so that's kind of that, that's the proposition right there. The proposition is the content or the meaning of the sentence. You know, it is raining. Right. Um, analogy might be something like, imagine if you have uh, a car, right? Say you have a car and you know, the car, there's a driver in the car, right? Uh, the car would be analogous to like a sentence or a statement that, you know, we're talking about propositional content. So the car is, is, uh, analogous to the sentence and the, uh, the driver is analogous to the proposition or the content of the sentence. In a sense, a statement or the sentence is the vehicle by which the proposition travels or, or is conveyed. Right. So, again, you know, the proposition, we're talking about uh, the content or the meaning of a sentence. Right. You know, the state, statements being the vehicles for those. All right. Well, with that being said, that's kind of what he's trying to angle for. He wants to angle towards uh, propositional truth. That's where he's steering the believer away from statements like Jesus, is the truth. And say, all right, we'll just, just focus here on propositional truths. Right. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Here's where it gets interesting. Um, 
he then defines he gives his he gives his definition of truth on page two two seventy right, and he says that truth um, is reality or exact representations of it, whether written, spoken, or otherwise mediated. Reality or exact excuse me, truth is reality or exact representations of it, whether written, spoken, or otherwise mediated. That's page two seventy, and then on page two seventy one he goes on to say, interesting. Uh, he says. Whatever reality is, it is what it is, even if we as human beings never come to grasp it. Reality is truth. That's a very interesting statement right there. It says reality is truth. Now, notice that he makes an identity relation, an identity claim between reality and truth, right? He says reality is truth. Again, let's talk about his definition. He says reality, truth is reality, or exact representations of it. So there's really two pieces to this definition of truth that he's given us, right? He's given us in the latter part, where he talks about exact representations of it, um, an understanding of truth that I think will probably be common amongst most philosophers, that truth corresponds to reality, right? So, you know, that's that's fine as far as propositional knowledge is concerned. But then he's taking his extra step. He's saying that reality is truth, right? Reality is truth. Now, if he wants to keep the conversation about propositional truths or propositional um, propositional knowledge, well, I'll just say propositional truth, then it seems to me that he's made some sort of conflation fallacy right here. Okay, a conflation fallacy in terms of he's taking two different things and he's treating them as if they're the same or treating them as if they're interchangeable, namely truth and reality, right? But truth and reality aren't the same. <laughs> right? Truth and reality aren't the same. There's two distinct, two distinct, uh, two distinct things there. Two distinct concepts, I should say. Right now, there is a relationship between uh, truth and reality. Right? If we take it to be the case that truth cor corresponds to reality, then the flip side of that is reality is a thing that truth corresponds to. Right? Reality is a thing that's being corresponded to, whereas truth is doing the corresponding. Right? These are two different things, but there's a relationship to you know between them. Right? But he's like, nah, like, you know, reality is truth. So he's going beyond there being this relationship between truth and reality, you know, some sort of correspondence rea uh, uh, relationship. And he's saying that, no, these things, you know, the, you know, one is the other, right? So again, if he wants to keep it, you know, as far as propositional truth, then I think he's made a conflation fallacy, right? He's taking two things that are clearly distinct, truth and reality, and treating them as if they're the same. But, you know, maybe he wants to be understood differently. Maybe he wants to... Um, I don't know. He maybe he wants to use the term truth in a different way. You know, he says that reality is truth. Maybe he wants to open up the discussion to a more uh, broad sense of that word truth. You know, to be more like kind of a metaphysical claim to say that reality is you know, you know like ultimate reality. You know, is truth. You know, maybe he's talking about truth in that sense. Um, and he, he very well may be. You know, uh, the problem is is if he doesn't want to keep the conversation on um on truth excuse me on propositional truth and he wants to talk about reality you know being truth he's been kind of making that identity relation again and maybe he wants to talk about you know ultimate reality in a broad sense then now it's kind of like well how are you opening that door to talk about truth in a non-propositional kind of capital t truth kind of a way you want to open that for yourself but at the same time when it comes to the christian when we want to talk about our understanding of absolute truth, excuse me, or ultimate reality, rather, you want to shut that door, right? Because when you think about it, the, the claim that reality is truth is akin to the Christian claim that Jesus is the truth. In both cases, um, somebody's making an ultimate reality claim. When we say that Jesus is the truth, we're not saying that he's like two plus two equals four. We're saying that he's ultimate reality, you know, that from which all truths are derived he's, he's something like that. That's what the Christian is saying when they say that Jesus is truth. You know, Jesus is the truth. But, you know, for Brady, he's saying that, well, reality is truth. And so he also is making an ultimate reality claim, you know, while at the same time uh, warning the Christian or, or encouraging the Christian to kind of check their ultimate reality claim at the door. Right. And so I think that uh, this is very interesting because. Actually, let me say this here. I'm going to read this other quote real quick. 
he says this on on like kind of like right after he warns the Christian to you know not bring Jesus' truth into the conversation. Um, the second reason he gives for Christians not doing that, he says this. He says, second, it might be helpful in conversations with people of other faiths to find common ground upon which to begin discussing such divisive matters. Uh, mutually acceptable generic definitions can go a long way in accomplishing that. My definitions will appear on the following page, right? So he's talking about like, we need to set aside this notion of referring to Jesus' truth in some sort of like robust, uh, ultimate reality sort of way. We need to set that aside because we need to have some common ground with people and common definitions and so on and so forth. Like, so he's kind of recommending that we have this, this uh, neutrality, so to speak, in terms of how we engage these conversations. But really, <laughs> if you break it down in terms of how he's leveraging this concept of truth, when he says that reality is truth, um, this is a false neutrality. Because on the one hand, again, he's telling the Christian that you have to lay aside your ultimate reality claim. But on the other end, he's saying that, oh, well, reality is true. And so he's opening the door for non-theistic ultimate reality claims You know, at the same time. So, for example, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. But in chapter 13, um, I want to read this quote. Uh, this is from page. Da, 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 da. All right. This is from page 315. Right. It's from page 315 in his book, Let There Be Gaslight. He says, uh, well, let me before I read this, you know, uh, this is a discussion where he's trying to essentially debunk or, or push back against uh, the argument for God's existence from logic. Right. So he's talking about logic here. Now, logic is generally speaking, I think you're generally understood to be truth directed. I'm saying logic points in the direction of truth and is in a sense connects us to truth, if you will. Right. Um, now, he says this, he says, can anyone deny that logic is simply the name that we have given the exercise of trying to think, speak and act in accordance with the material world around us? Uh, whenever we think, speak and act out of alignment with the uh, with the nature of the external world we encounter, it can be said that we are being illogical. And we can say that logic is universal, he puts in quotes, to the extent that this matter as in the material world maintains the same properties and characteristics wherever it can be found in the universe. But if these characteristics change, for example, in quantum physics, then what was previously thought to be illogical might become logical. At very least, a different logic will need will be needed to properly map onto the different reality. You know, so he says um, he basically calls the physical world reality at this point. Right. He calls the physical world reality. He says he talks about how logic maps itself onto the material world. Right. And, you know, if for some if there's some change in the material world, then we'd have to change our logic. So logic is contingent upon the material world. And in, in order, uh, he talks about properly mapping onto this different reality, if such was the case. Well, he now he's using reality and the material world or the universe interchangeably. Right. So essentially, before he was saying that reality um, is truth. And here he's using reality interchangeable with the physical universe. Right. So if that's the case, then essentially he's saying the physical universe is, is truth, right? Well, that's the ultimate reality claim. He's saying that the physical universe is the ultimate reality claim. Is that which to toward which uh, logic is directed? Um, again, he uses it inter, uh, interchangeably, uh, the physical universe interchangeably with reality. He's saying, you know, essentially that's, that's his ultimate reality. And so, again, you know, um, I think what we have here is this false neutrality where out the gate he wants to, you know, have Christians check their ultimate reality claims at the door. Um, and at the same time, his definition of truth as you know, as in reality, reality is truth or that which corresponds to truth. Um, his definition of truth leaves the door wide open for his own non theistic uh claims about what truth is his own non-theistic ultimate reality claims right so again this is a false neutrality right it's, it's, it's almost kind of like uh like back in the day like i'm thinking about like you know alexander hamilton times where you would have like a duel or something like that and uh you know you'd have two dudes facing off or, or facing opposite, direct, opposite directions and taking 10 steps as opposed to the turn and shoot on 10 you know, and then one dude turns around and shoots at like the fifth step or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like that's kind of what Brady is doing. Like we're expected to take the full 10 steps, you know, uh, by checking our uh, ultimate reality claim of the door. 
but he's turned around at step number five. You know what I mean? He's smuggling in or at least leaving room for his own ultimate reality claims while expecting us to check ours at the door. Well, if his goal is to have, uh, you know, dialogue and, and, you know, kind of common ground and those kinds of things, that's not common ground. That's conceding ground to a, a non-theistic worldview, right? So it's almost kind of like a sleight of hand in a sense, you know what I mean? Now, I'm not going to say that, you know, um, you know, he, that's what he intended. I mean, I, I don't know. I can't read the man's mind or his heart, but in effect, that's what's going on. It's like this is sleight of hand of false neutrality where you, essentially the, the Christian is behind the eight ball off top, you know, as he makes um, ultimate reality claims and we're, you know, warned not to, you know. So off top, man, I, I think there's some problems there in terms of, of what he's putting out there um, in terms of how, how he's handling this concept of, uh, of truth. But <laughs> so, but that's not all. You know, there, there's definitely some other problems as well. So uh, as you move forward in the book, you know, you know just, just a couple pages over or maybe pages or so over. Um, he introduces this hierarchy, you know, he's got like this, um, again, he's got his, his list of concepts. He's got truth, knowledge, belief, perception, and opinion. And he does some interesting things with it. You know what I mean? Um, matter of fact, first, I'm going to read these definitions and then I'm going to, um, kind of, we'll dig into, I think how he mishandles this as well. So again, truth, he lists out as being reality or exact representations of it. Uh, then he's got knowledge, which he describes as being having an accurate awareness of some facet of reality. Um, thirdly, he has belief, which he defines as being trust that a particular understanding of reality can be verified. It will be justified. Um, then next after that, he has perception, which he defines as a, a personal view of reality based on the limited information and experience of a limited observer. And then lastly, he's got opinion. You know, which he says is a perception that's honored as reality, treated like knowledge, held as strongly as belief, and often preached like truth. Right. So you've got truth, knowledge, belief, perception and opinion. Those are the concepts that he that he lists out. Right. Now, um, I want this is where it gets kind of interesting. I want to I want to read this portion of his book. This is found on page um Da, 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 da. This, this is found on pages 270 and 271. You know, I'm going to put this up on the screen, but I want y'all to really check this out and see what he does after he's laid out these these different uh, concepts that he's defining. Right. He says, uh, quote, of course, it is only fair after stress testing the, the students definitions that I give them an the opportunity to take issue with mine. And you may as well. Thanks, fanatic. We definitely would do that. Uh, nevertheless, <laughs> these will serve as our working definitions for this discussion. You might have noticed that as defined, the terms descend from strongest to weakness in veracity, with uh, the strongest being truth. Whatever the reality is, it is what it is, even if we human beings never come to grasp it. Reality is truth. So that's at, that's at the top of his veracity hierarchy or this this uh, amongst the concepts that he's given us. Right. Uh, next on the list is our apprehension of reality knowledge and then what we are willing to accept as reality without confirmation that's belief and then below that is our experience of reality perception and then last is our interpretation of that experience you know which he calls opinion now this is where he gets interested so he says however the exercise is not yet complete right here's the important question if you had to pick one which of the above terms best describes christianity Think about it for a moment. Instinctively, the Christian wants to say it is truth, just as some um, someone of another religion will want to claim about his or her faith as the truth. But how does one know if what he or she understands, especially when it comes to spiritual matters, is the truth? Right. Aren't people of faith, Christians included, operating at the level of belief? Right. So he's questioning. He's saying he's talking about truth. And he said, well, Christians are operating at the level of belief. At least he's implying that. Right. He says, are people of faith, Christians included, operating at the level of belief? Uh, Jesus reportedly claimed to be the truth, but also called others to believe in him. Right. Uh, cites John 14, 6 and John 6, 29. The author of First John 5, 13 says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This raises the question, at what point can we say that we have knowledge? i.e. accurate awareness 
of some facet of reality and not just what we believe, right? Like some sort of just mere belief. Now, um, <laughs> this, this is wild, man. So that's, that's on page 270 through 271, right? Now, I think there's two things here in that passage that, that are really problematic, right? There are two things in this passage that are really problematic. So I want to, you know, section out two quotes that kind of will help us to hone in on the, the two mistakes that I think he's making. So one, again, I'm going to quote it. He says, you might have noticed that as defined, the terms descend from strongest to weakness in veracity, the strongest being truth. Veracity just means accuracy. And so he believes in, in terms of the concepts that he's laid out, they're on this hierarchy with truth, um, knowledge, belief, perception and opinion. You know, they're kind of on this hierarchy of accurate of accuracy, you know, veracity. Right. Um, he's just got them all in the same uh, spectrum, if you will, in terms of veracity. So I think that's problem number one. We'll get into why in a second. Uh, number two, he draws our attention to his list of terms and he asks, if you had to pick one, which of the above terms best describes Christianity? Right. That seems like an honest question, right? Well, there's actually a flaw. <laughs> there's, there's a big flaw in that question, given how he set things up that I think leads to a false Pentalemma, <laughs> a false pentalemma. Now, uh, I think many of us are familiar with a false dilemma, uh, which is a logical fallacy that presents only two options or sides when there are many options or sides, right? Uh, but, you know, penta, you know, means five. I think we've got a false pentalemma. <laughs> false pentalemma. This, this is a whole nother level right here, right? As far as dilemmas are concerned, you know, he's lists out five options. You know, again, truth, knowledge, belief. Uh, perception and uh, opinion. Those are five options. And he says between those, uh, which one best describes uh, Christianity? So I think we have a false uh, pentalemma here. You know? So here, here's where the problem is, right? Well, actually, there, there's more than one. We'll just kind of work our way through it. Uh, first of all, going back to that uh, veracity spectrum, that, that hierarchy he's got, you know, those, those concepts that he's listed out from, from truth all the way down to opinion, I think the way that this chapter is written, I mean, you pretty much have like a subtle um, or maybe not so subtle category error or category fallacy uh, in regard to truth and knowledge. Right. He jumbles together truth, knowledge with uh, belief, perception and opinion all on this spectrum, this one spectrum of veracity. Uh, the problem is, is that when it comes to truth, I'll just kind of start there. Truth is a very different kind of thing then perceptions, uh, you know, beliefs and opinions, right? Uh, when it comes to truth, uh, even if we just go on his, his definition, you know, reality or exact representations of it, um, truth is not the kind of thing that uh, perceptions are, you know, or beliefs are or opinions are, right? Um, when it comes to truth, I'm saying when it comes to those three things, beliefs, perceptions and opinions, those are all mental states. Those are all mental states, right? Truth is not a mental state, <laughs> okay? Truth, hopefully, is the object of our mental states. Hopefully, our beliefs, perceptions, and opinions are being aimed such that we're trying to obtain truth, right? But truth is the object of a mental state. Uh, it's, it's not a mental state in and of itself, you know what I'm saying? Like beliefs, perceptions, and opinions. We can say the same thing when it comes to knowledge. You know, uh, knowledge, I think he kind of words it in a, in a weird kind of a way, but even if we take his definition, uh, in terms of having an accurate awareness of some facet of reality, um, it's not clear cut, you know, that the knowledge is, is a, a mental state like beliefs are or perceptions are, opinions are, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, he goes on to uh, just a few pages. Matter of fact, I want to get this right because I don't want nobody to say I'm quoting him wrong. Uh, in page 272, you know, when it comes to knowledge, uh, he gives a more um, conventional definition of what knowledge is. This is where we get into epistemology, you know, that branch of uh, philosophy that has to deal with knowledge and how do we obtain it and, and, and that sort of a thing. Um, but classically defined, knowledge is understood to be justified true belief, you know, justified true belief. Um, those are like three elements that when you combine them, you know, it's kind of like Captain Planet, like when our powers combine, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, justify true belief, you have knowledge, right? Um Imagine if, uh, well, let me just put it this way. You know, first of all, you have to have truth in order to have knowledge, because um, if you are saying that something is the case, you, well, essentially you can't know something that's not true. So you have to have truth in the mix in order to have knowledge, right? Also, in order to have knowledge, you can't have knowledge of something that you don't believe, 
right? So if you have something that's true and then you put your belief directed at that truth, now you you know step closer to having knowledge, right? You believe something that is true. But then there's this part about justification. You know, now people have different perspectives on you know what justification is and, and that sort of a thing, but roughly speaking, justification has to do with the reasons for which you hold a belief. And if you have solid reasons for holding a belief in something that's true, then you've got a combination of those three components and you have knowledge. It's kind of like if I say I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, if I have the peanut butter and the bread, but no jelly, I don't have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> and likewise, when it comes to justify a true belief, uh, if you don't have one of those elements, if you're missing any of them, then you don't have um, knowledge. Right. Uh, but again, those different elements, they kind of combine. They work together to you know, yield what we call uh, knowledge. And this is what he describes again, you know, um, in chapter 272, he says the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy discusses a well-known concept of knowledge as justified true belief. This understanding can be represented by the following tripartite analysis of what is necessary and sufficient for knowledge. I mean, as a per I'll just say uh, a person knows that P, that such and such is the case. Um, that person believes uh, so something is the case. And that person is justified in believing that something is the case. Okay, so you know that's what you have now: justified true belief. All right. Now again, you know, just like truth is a very different thing than beliefs, perceptions, and opinions. In so much as beliefs, perceptions, and opinions are mental states, right? The states of the mind, and truth is not a mental state; it's something that you would hope to obtain with one's mental state. Likewise, knowledge is, is also an object of uh, mental states, right? Knowledge is not a mental state, you know, uh, purely speaking, right? It's, it's a little bit more than that. It's, it might, we might call it like a flavor of belief, but not just belief in and of itself, right? Uh, belief connects with truth and justification to yield knowledge. So it's a very different thing than just a mental state. So in so much as that's the case, again, he's got this veracity scale of truth, knowledge, beliefs, perceptions, and opinions, but those top two, knowledge and truth, are objects, you know, uh, which we would hope that our beliefs, perceptions and opinions, those three mental states would reach out to and obtain. Right. We hope to attain uh, truth by way of acquiring knowledge. That's how that works. Right. So, again, there's this 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 category here where he's taking different kinds of things and they're lumping him. He's lumping him all into this one scale of veracity. Now, here's where it becomes, I think, uh, a bit of a clash is that um, you know truth is an object of the other four uh, terms, not like a higher form of them or something like that. It's not like truth is a higher version of beliefs, perceptions, and, and opinions, you know, something like that. And likewise, same thing with knowledge. Like knowledge is not like uh, you know another form; it's its own kind of thing. You know, knowledge is this composite, this combination of beliefs, truth, and justification, right? Uh, whereas beliefs, perceptions, and opinions, those are just mental states, right? So in so much as this is the case, again, this is kind of a, a category error. And so it's just wrong headed, <laughs> just, just really wrong headed, you know, the way that he pits truth, knowledge, beliefs, perception, and opinions somewhat against one another. And then asks us to pick one of them, ask the reader, reader to just pick one out and say, which one represents Christianity the best? You know, um, truth isn't in competition with the other concepts, but rather is that which one hopes to gain by acquiring knowledge of it. That's that's what, tr what truth is. Right. And um, again, in so much as belief is um, not like some sort of it's not in competition with truth, but actually combines with truth and justification to yield knowledge. You know, it's just kind of, again, wrong headed to position the two like against one another, like whether you have truth or belief. I'm saying like which one best describes like it's not necessarily the case that you have to choose one or the other, right? Because they work together. So what a Christian could say uh, in response to Brady, I'll just kind of read it off my notes here. Uh, in response to Brady's false pantalemma, uh, namely that um, we can say that none of his options adequately describe Christianity or the position the Christian finds themselves in. The Christian isn't left with the mere, uh, with mere belief such that they aren't operating at the level of truth. Rather, Christianity is true and we can argue that we have justifiable belief in the truth of Christianity. The combination of justification, belief, and the truth of Christianity constitutes knowledge of the truth. Therefore, the Christian is operating at the level of truth, not merely belief. You know, so again, he's got this false pantalemma, but there's other options. <laughs> we have other options, namely what I laid out. You know, so 
it's just kind of weird, man. You know, like he's got this veracity scale and then he correctly describes, you know, uh, knowledge just a couple pages later, you know? So it's almost like his, his veracity scale and the correct understanding of, of knowledge, truth and belief and how they work together. It's like, he's clashing with himself from page to page. You know what I mean? It's like his, his book is, is almost like a war with himself as he's trying to wrap his mind around, uh, this, this concept of the truth, you know, his arguments are, are clashing with one another, you know, and the result of that is this false, uh, pantalemma, you know, anyway. Um, so I'm sure we can discre- uh, expect Brady to dispute that, uh, which is fine. Uh, but he would have to really show us how that's not a false, uh, category error laden pantalemma that, that he's left us with. You know what I mean? All right, so let's talk about uh, beliefs right quick. You know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I kind of covered it in the uh, the short clip that I, that I posted the other day. Uh, but I think he's got some missteps, you know, in terms of how he construes uh, belief and, and how he defines it here. So uh, he defines belief as trust that a particular understanding of reality can be verified or will be justified. Right. Again, trust that a particular understanding of reality can be verified or will be justified. Right. So now, as I understand it, you know, the a, a common way to render um, or understand what belief is, is that it's a propositional attitude that something is the case, or a propositional attitude that something is the case. So if somebody, again, says it's raining outside, um, that's your proposition. And then my attitude towards it is either I take it to the beat to be the case, which would be belief or I don't, which would be disbelief. Right. Um, but in addition to like a propositional attitude, he's got like this extra piece of understanding a reality where he says a trust that a particular understanding of reality can be verified or will be justified. Right now it's like, he's got like this extra piece. You know, he's got like this non-standard definition where he includes this, this extra piece of like this, this verification clause. I mean, like in order to believe something, you have to have this trust, you know, that um, it can or will be justified, it can be verified or will be justified. Um, but then we can ask ourselves, like, does this, uh, his rendering of belief, does it really describe, um, how we encounter our states of belief? And I would say that the answer is probably not. <laughs> right. Um, so let me give a quick, uh, counter example, you know, and hopefully we, we can, uh, like this will make sense. Right. So let's just say, what if I subscribe to a widely held belief, you know, that I take to be more likely the case than not. Right. And um, let's just say I'm not really sure about my reasons. You know, I just, I just know it's a widely held belief. I take it to be the case, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Right. Um, also, um, let's just say that this widely held belief, I'm not really sure if it can be verified or not. You know, maybe it can. Maybe it can't. I don't know if it'll be justified or not. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm 50 50 on it. Maybe it will. You know, maybe it won't. Right. If I find myself in that state, then Brady would say that, OK, well, I really don't believe it, you know. But I think it's kind of problematic, you know, so I'm going to use a, a more concrete example to, I think, you know, maybe draw this out. Right. Let's say that I'm a, a cosmologist. Right. Uh, you know, I'm not an apologist. I'm a cosmologist. I'm out here in the field of cosmology, researching the universe and the universe's beginnings. You know? Now, it's a pretty common or widely held belief amongst cosmologists that there is some natural or some sort of naturalistic uh, explanation for how the universe began, right? You know, that's a probably a common belief, I would imagine, right? Um, but coupled with that, you know, there's some skepticism about whether or not we'll ever get to the point where we can verify that, you know? Uh, for example, some believe that there is like this, essentially somewhat of a, a horizon, if you will, in terms of how far back into the universe we can look, you know, with our telescopes and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's like this, this part where um, there's a point at which we can't see any further in terms of, you know, uh, the universe is beginning, if you will. Right. Um, so some would say that, you know, we'll never be able to, to overcome that. And so we'll never be able to verify that there is a naturalistic explanation for the universe. Nevertheless, they believe that it is, um, other people or maybe they're agnostic about it. Maybe they think that maybe we'll verify it. Maybe we won't, maybe there'll, there'll be a way to justify the belief that there's a naturalistic beginning of the universe. Maybe it won't, you know, now, if you find yourself, um, uh, if I'm that cosmologist and I find myself saying, Hey, I think there's a naturalistic explanation to the universe. This is a widely held belief, but I don't know if it'll be verified or justified. I think that one could fairly say, well, I believe it to be the case. You know what I'm saying? I take it to be true that there's this naturalistic beginning, you know, 
But on Brady's definition, I wouldn't be holding that belief because I don't have some sort of trust or assurance that it can be verified or um, or that it will be justified. Right now, the problem is that, you know, really, if, if that's not a belief, then the other categories that Brady offers don't account for whatever this what I'm referring to as a belief is either. Right. If you look at his definitions of perception, he says a personal view of reality based on uh, the limited information and experience of a limited observer. But um, that doesn't account for what I'm experiencing because I'm subscribing to a view that's widely held amongst other cosmologists in my field. So, you know, what I am experiencing, I'm calling it a belief, but it wouldn't be uh, on his definition a belief, nor would it be a perception. And then um, he describes an opinion as a perception um, honored as reality, treated like knowledge, held as strongly as a belief, and often preached like truth. Well, at least on two counts, you know, I can't be said to be holding an opinion because, first of all, uh, he describes an opinion as being a perception. Um, and I've already said, hey, well, according to his definition, I don't hold a perception because I hold a widely held belief, not just my own personal view. And then secondly, um, let's just say, what if I don't treat it as knowledge? What if I just think such and such is the case? What if I think it's the case that there's a naturalistic beginning to the universe? But I kind of treat it more like a hunch or a suspicion. I don't treat it as if it's something that I, I know, you know. Um, well, if that's the case, then on those two counts, I don't have an opinion either. <laughs> you know, So now I find myself with this mental state that um, I'm describing as a belief, uh, but there's nothing that in... Uh, in Brady's concept that he lays out that can really account for this experience that I think most of us would commonly call and recognize to be a belief, you know, somebody holding such and such to be the case, right? So the problem is that it seems that he's trying to give the reader kind of a lay of the land of mental states uh, that relate to truth and knowledge. And his definitions of belief, perception, and opinion allow some experiences that we call beliefs to fall through the cracks, right? And uh, that oversight kind of represents a hole in his account of uh, the way that he thinks that things are, right? Uh, he can't account for these common experiences that we refer to as beliefs in his kind of you know hierarchy or however he construes uh, those concepts that he laid out. So rather than having this loose end, you know, it would be better just to take a, a more common definition rather than his kind of idiosyncratic or, or um, I guess, kind of verification heavy <laughs> account of what a belief is and just simply say that a belief is a propositional attitude is a propositional attitude that something is the case, you know, just kind of leave off the excess uh, verification um, uh, condition. You know, his perspective just doesn't account for the common ways that we experience beliefs. You know, now another point on that, uh, which I think is also problematic is and, I, and again, I won't spend too much time on this because I mentioned this in the, the video clip that I posted like last week. But, um, you know, he just flat out misuses scripture. <laughs> Brady just misuses scripture in a way that I think is uh, just again, just elementary basic. I don't I don't know how he missed it, but let me just read this this passage here. Um, he says, aren't people of faith, Christians included, operating at the level of belief? Uh, Jesus reportedly claimed to be the truth, but also called others to believe in him. You know, he cites again, uh, John 14, 6, and then John 6, 29. Uh, the author of 1 John 5, 13 says uh, that I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This raises the question, at what point can we say that we have knowledge, i.e. accurate awareness of some facet of reality and not just what we believe? You know. Now, again, you know, this is another mishandling of a concept similar to what we saw when he, we were dealing with the issue of truth, you know, where he um, talks about truth in a propositional sense, but then just kind of gets funny when it comes to handling this, uh, handling truth in terms of like, like ultimate reality in that sense, like in the same way, uh, we have like this nuance kind of being mishandled here, because as he's talking about truth versus belief, he seems to be pointing again towards like propositional truth, you know, saying that we don't have truth that Christianity um, you know, we don't have any grounds to stand on in terms of saying that Christianity is true, you know, uh, from a propositional standpoint, he says, we're just operating, you know, at belief on the level of belief. And then he, you know, quotes the scriptures, but the, he, the problem is he ignores the obvious distinction between belief that and belief in belief that and belief in, right. When it comes to belief that, you know, that's kind of like that propositional truth, belief that Jesus is the Christ or, or belief that he died on the cross. Maybe that might be a better one, you know, belief that 
um, he rose from the grave. That's that, that's your belief. That's right there. Um, but in the scriptures that he quotes, I mean, I'll just read it. You know, first John five thirteen again says, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. John chapter six, verse 29 says the work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. So in, in both of these cases, the author is using a belief in as in belief in Christ or putting your trust in Christ. Right. That's what it's talking about. Right. He's not talking about propositional knowledge here. Right. And so Brady's taking a jab at Christianity in terms of propositional knowledge. But then Brady is citing passages that um, are using the term belief in the sense of non-propositional belief as in to trust in or believe in rather than believe at which would be believe that which would be more so uh propositional so again you know we're seeing this just a really sloppy use of these concepts you know whereas um you know you're not regarding the belief that versus the belief in and citing just the wrong passages to make his case <laughs> you can't be talking about proposition as like the belief that kind of belief and then be citing passages that are talking about belief in kind of belief you know that's just a really sloppy oversight, you know, which again, this is just kind of stuff I'm talking about, man. Like it just causes me to kind of lose confidence uh, in, in writers you know, who are trying to make a case. You know and I mean, when these kinds of basic concepts are not being accounted for. All right. So, you know, that's, that's enough about belief. But um, <laughs> let's move on to the last concept, man. Uh, logic, Your logic, you know, see how he deals with that. Um, so in page 274, he defines logic. Uh, he says logic can be defined as the mind faithfully mapping itself onto the external world, right? Mind can be defined, excuse me, logic can be defined as the mind faithfully mapping itself onto the external world. There's a couple of problems there that I want to read a little bit more of what he says about logic to so kind of like really like piece this out. So, you know, I want to make sure I'm quoting him correctly. Uh, this is from chapter three, excuse me, chapter 13, <clears throat> page uh, 314, 315. He says, can anyone deny that logic is simply the name that we have given the exercise of trying to think, speak and act in accordance with the material world around us? I want you to pay attention to that, you know, the material world again as we're kind of going through it. Whenever we think, speak or act out of alignment with the nature of the external world we encounter, it can be said that we are being illogical. And we can say that logic is, quote, universal. He puts in scare quotes, I guess, uh, to the extent that this matter, the material world, maintains the same properties and characteristics wherever it can be found in the universe. But if these characteristics change, for example, in quantum physics, uh, then what was previously thought to be illogical might become logical. Right now, at very least, a different uh, logic will be need. Excuse me, a different logic will be needed to properly map onto the different reality. Is it true then that there could be no laws of logic without God and specifically the God of the Bible? Well, only if uh, it is true that there could be no material world without God. And we have already addressed this above unless or until God steps forward and makes a believable claim concerning the creation of the universe. Uh, what reason do we have to think that the only possible cause of uh, for matter and logic is a personal God? If it can be argued, it goes further. This is page 316. If it can be argued that human logic is not necessarily a reflection of God's mind, but instead refers to the mind of mankind uh, mapping itself onto the natural world, the question can still be asked, what about the mind? And so now, again, he's talking about human logic, right? You know, that uh, it can be argued that human logic is not necessarily a reflection of God's mind, but basically the mind of mankind uh, mapping itself onto the natural world. So two problems, I would say big problems arise from Brady's assessment here. Uh, number one, logic is not created by, nor is it contingent upon human minds. That's number one. We'll get into that in a second. And then number two, logic is not contingent upon the physical world, a.k.a. the universe. So there's two problems we want to kind of um, take a look at. So first of all, logic is not human mind dependent. Now, we could be flipping and say that before humans even came along, apes and orangutans and you know several other types of animals were already uh, mapping their minds onto the physical world and ma in manners that we might describe as being logical. You know what I'm saying? He said that if we're aligning with essentially the physical world, uh, the way that things are, then, you know, that's logical. Well, other animals do that all the time. So if that be the case, then already we can't just say that logic is, is human mind dependent because you got other species, uh, applying what he would refer to as being logical. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, 
if you think about it, let's just say that there were no humans on the earth right now. Or just say that, you know, five, six billion years ago before, you know, human works, you know, human, uh, humans were around on some sort of evolutionary account. Um, no humans, no animals, nothing, right? Um, if you were to kind of imagine that, at, you know, that point, if you kind of think about it, even at that point, wouldn't it still be the case that uh, the planet Earth was identical to itself? Right. You know, would, would it be true that the planet Earth back then before human minds were around was identical to itself? Right. Would it also be true that the planet Earth was identical to itself and not some other planet in the same way at the same time? I mean, obviously, right. You know, obviously that would be the case, you know, in which case already you got two laws of logic at play already, you know, no minds around, but the state of affairs, you know, still you have these two laws of logic holding true, namely the, the law of, of identity and the law of uh, non-contradiction, right? So you don't need human minds for that. You don't need human minds for the state of affairs that we later come along and describe um, in terms that we can understand. Uh, you don't need humans around for the state of affairs to reflect the laws of logic, right? Uh, same thing with mathematics, you know, would it be true, you know, again, billions of years before humans showed up, that the planet Earth uh, and the planet Jupiter, the, the, the planets that we call Earth and Jupiter, together combined to, to form a, a quantity of what we call two planets. You know, wouldn't that be the case? You know, is it was mathematics, uh, which is grounded in logic. You know, wouldn't that still uh, hold true even if no humans were around? Well, of course it is. <laughs> of course that would be the case, right? Of course the laws of logic and mathematics would still hold true billions of years before, before humans showed up because the reality is you know these you know the the reality of logic sits outside of our mental states and our ability to apprehend it you know the laws of logic are a fixture of reality if you will okay and these are things that we don't just we don't make them up we discover logic we discover mathematics right uh we may use we may create terms and and ways of communicating our understanding of these laws of logic and mathematics but we don't create them you know what i'm saying we don't create the reality of them we may at best create ways to describe them to one another that's about as best as we can say you know so again this all demonstrates that logic is not human mind dependent right uh, again you know um there's a second problem, you know, of logic. <laughs> Again, logic is not contingent upon the physical world. You know what I mean? Uh, AKA the universe. I think it's fair to say that most philosophers would agree that logic is something that's considered to be necessary, meaning no matter how reality would have fell together, I'm saying whether there was a physical world or not, you know, it would still be the case that logic and the laws thereof would be reflective of reality. They would be fixtures of reality, no matter what, you know what I mean? Um, but I think that Brady just really uh, doesn't capture this. I'm not going to you know, get into all this because actually some of this I covered in my um, video with Eli Ayala. So I would encourage you to check that out with him. But again, if you think about um, how we gain knowledge, you know, Brady says, uh, actually, I'm just going to read it um, on page. Again, I'm not trying to misquote him. I don't want to be accused of that. Page 275, he says that as a child, I had unwittingly stumbled upon the realization that the validity of our logic with which we can have knowledge of reality comes to us in two ways through empirical perception and parentheses what our five senses relate to our minds and rational processing the reasoning power of our minds working upon the data uh, fed to us by our five senses you know uh, so he tries to you know uh, essentially just kind of use technical terms weave together this notion of empiricism and rationalism you know empiricism being the idea that we gain our knowledge primarily through experience rationalism kind of pushing back against that in some sense um and not privileging experience in terms of what our sources of of knowledge are now that being the case um again i'm going to appeal to uh, stanford encyclopedia of philosophy you know where it says in its most general terms the dispute between rationalism and empiricism has been taken to concern the extent to which we are dependent upon experience in our effort to gain knowledge of the external world it says it is common to think of experience itself as being of two kinds sense experience involving our five world-oriented senses and reflective experience including conscious awareness of our mental operations you know now 
already again that's pretty striking because in brady's account of how we gain knowledge he only it really appeals to the senses you know we gain knowledge through experience through our senses and then to whatever extent our minds can work with the data from our senses uh, but you know when it comes to um what i just just read here certainly are accounts of empiricism that include not only sense data but also reflective experience you're kind of reflecting on the internal world if you will things that, that can be gained or knowledge that, that can be gained uh from the inside out so to speak you know so this kind of goes back to an example that i gave on ayala's show you know where i'm like if you have somebody who has no sensory um inputs like no ability to sense the outside world um still they can know their own mental states uh directly you know we know the external world in a sense indirectly you know mediated to us through the senses but consciousness is different you know what i'm saying we know conscious consciousness in a direct way that's just kind of the nature of how consciousness works and in so much as i can be aware of myself um i can be aware that i am myself and not somebody else you know i can also be aware that um i am numerically one self as opposed to a multiplicity of selves so in that right there, I can already derive that there's some, there's a law of logic and, you know, the law of identity again, you know, is cropping up as well as laws, uh, excuse me, uh, just, you know, mathematics, you know, coming into play, knowing myself as a single self, as opposed to multiplicity. Now I'm acquainted with mathematics. I can discern that just from that reflective experience. I'm saying reflected upon my mental states, not relying upon some sort of, um, you know, uh, external experience to derive those kinds of truths, you know. Right. So I was trying to <laughs> finish up my very last point, but unfortunately, my uh, camera died. So I had to switch cameras and my son woke up. So I got him. Hopefully I, I got this bottle here that will keep him chill long enough for me to <laughs> make this last point here. Uh, talk Talking about logic or la last two points. I would just make this quick, man, because, you know, he, he's probably about to blow up here any second. But anyway, um, you know. When it comes to logic mapping onto the external world, to material world, again, logic is not contingent upon uh, matter or the material world. That's a fact of the matter. Uh, shout out to my guy Alfredo for uh, he's on the phone. And he he made this point and uh, you helped me to see this more clearly. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, again, I think most philosophers would would you know shudder at the notion that somehow you know logic is contingent, particularly contingent upon uh, the natural world. Um, cause first of all, you know, back to, you know, the quote that he had, he talked about how, if, if the physical world was different in some region of the universe or in, in, you know, wherever we encountered such a difference that we would need some sort of other logic to map onto it and to better understand it. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that we wouldn't even know that some region of the universe was different without first, uh, and presupposing, uh, the laws of logic. We, <laughs> we had to presuppose it we'd have to presuppose the laws of logic, uh, even in um, having to make some sort of determination that some state of affairs uh, was different, you know, i.e. not identical to the ones for, to which we are, are familiar, you know. Um, and so in so much as that's the case, you would still have in this new physical uh, region of the universe that we're countering, you would still have the laws of logic as we understand it, yielding truths about that other state of affairs, namely that is different than that which we're accustomed to. And so if that's the case, if you have the laws of logic, as we understand it, yielding truths about some other physical state of the universe, you know, then aside from having to, as he says, you know, use some other form of logic already, you have the laws of logic as we know it bearing truth on that other state of affairs. And so if the laws of logic are able to bear a truth about our current state of affairs, and also able to bear truth about this other state of affairs, that if whatever it would be that we would encounter with some different physical universe, then therefore the laws of logic would be transcended. It would tra transcend both physical states of affairs. I'm saying we'd be bearing truth about both and thus transcended of both, you know? And so therefore, if that's the case, then it's pretty evident that logic is not contingent upon physical reality, but at least in principle could transcend physical reality in order to tell us something about uh, physical reality, regardless of how, you know, similar or different we encounter it, you know what I'm saying, no matter, even if it were true on some sort of like quantum level, quantum mechanical level, there are certain things that we can know, i.e., hey, there's something different going on here, right? Also, you know, like changes in physical states of affairs, you know, just can't in principle change certain uh, logical truths. You know, for example, um, is it possible for a triangle to have 20 sides? You know, can, can a triangle have 20 sides and 20 angles? 
Um, no, <laughs> obviously, definition, definitionally, it would just be logically incoherent to suggest that there could be a triangle with 20 different sides and 20 angles, right? That's just not what a triangle is, right? So it doesn't really matter how the universe could change. It doesn't really matter what sort of physical states of the universe that we can count as different in our own. There's really no change that could occur uh, in the physical universe that would um, alter the fact that there are just there are certain things that are just going to be true no matter what reality turns out to be like. You know, there were always there's no such thing as a circle with four sides. There's no such thing as a triangle with 15 sides. You know, those things that would just be logically incoherent. You know, so again, you have. Uh, logical truths I'm saying, or maybe metaphysical truths that would hold true regardless of uh, what the physical states of, of the world might might be uh, lastly I'm gonna just kind of throw this out here just you know uh, spitballing a little bit but lastly um, there are just certain things about uh, logic and about metaphysical truths that we can know that really transcend the natural world I mean mathematicians all the time deal with like infinities and uh well i'll just stick with that they deal with the concept of infinity and mathematical equations and just by the nature of what infinity infinity is you can't have an infinite number of actual things in the, in the physical universe and so that's uh the concept of infinity even though we can logically uh, manipulate it in mathematical equations there's just no possible way that this could be the case um you know just derived from the physical universe itself like it just doesn't map its infinity doesn't map itself onto the physical universe that way you know uh likewise um if i say that out of nothing nothing comes as a metaphysical concept right um if you have a state of absolute negation where there's no thing no capacities no properties no nothing that state of affairs cannot cause anything to come to be right that's just the nature of what nothingness is now obviously you can't encounter nothingness in the physical world that's the, that, that's impossible you're not going to encounter nothingness like straight up nothingness in the physical world right there's always going to be at very least you know space or something like that right so again um this concept of absolute negation right uh just a state of absolute nothingness you know there's certain things that we can know about it namely its impotence to produce something that you know, just doesn't map on to uh to matter you know um so yeah so again there's just certain things i think that uh you know brady has kind of been uh <laughs> somewhat misguided here when it comes to uh truth when it comes to belief when it comes to logic you know you have him getting these definitions like super wrong at every turn which, like I said before, you know, what I mean, it just kind of inclines me to I mean, it's just it's just a red flag that suggests to me that there's something going on here um, and causes me to lose confidence in him as his ability to really uh, make a case. You know, what I mean, uh, against Christianity, um, it just seems like he would need to, you know, brush some things up before he had that kind of credibility, at, le at least in my book. You know, uh, that being said, um, you know, uh, we're still going to be you know moving forward. We're going to do a, a critique of Chapter 13. Uh, with my guy MJ Jackson, we're going to be doing um, a critique of chapters 14 and 15, and I'm going to get to the punchline of chapter 12 probably in my next video. You know, just basically those four pathways that he laid out. Should we follow him in that? Um, in the meantime, you know, I would definitely encourage you to check out the other videos in this series, man. Cats have been putting out some bangers, definitely been dope. Uh, but I'm gonna go feed my son. You know, he's, he's uh, he probably needs to eat breakfast right now. Uh, but with that being said, y'all know what it is, man. Love God, love people, take care of the things that God blesses you with. Definitely subscribe to the channel. Uh, hit me up on, uh, you, uh, I guess, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon if you feel so inclined to support the channel, man. Y'all know what it is, yo. Love y'all. Peace.